Well, Pentecost is one of my favorite days in church life because you don't have to worry about buying Pentecost cards. You don't give Pentecost gifts. At least I haven't known anything to do that. There aren't eggs that you have to hide that are Pentecost eggs or anything like that. It is a great holiday in the church tradition because we can just come together to be in celebrative worship. If there's anything that we should have today, it's probably a giant birthday cake in front of us because that's what this day is about in Christianity. Our tradition views the day of Pentecost as the day that the church was born. It is the day that the book of the Acts of Apostles speaks of the promise of God's Spirit finally coming into this world, that hope that Jesus talked about being fulfilled. It was the day, our tradition holds, that Jesus' disciples were newly charged to begin the mission of establishing the way, as it was called, this new approach towards the faith experience. And God's Spirit, the story tells us, was manifest in amazing ways in the winds, in sounds, in the written recollection that it was like tongues of fire were descending upon the people. So in case you wondered why the sanctuary is decorated in this fashion today, it's a reminder of that day of Pentecost, that day in our ancient history when things were pulled together so that God's marvelous new work could be done among the people. Of course, over almost 2,000 years of history, this event in the church's memory has been responsible for establishing what we know is a worldwide movement that has and continues to heavily influence our human history. Even though there are people who today like to say that those who choose no religion are the most growing part of the population, it's naive at best to suggest, to suggest that religion does not have influence on who we are as the human family. It has profound influence in its many manifestations. And in our case, this religious seed that's been planted has created the institution we know as the church from that activity on the day of Pentecost. And as we look around, we know it is now realized in many, many different denominations and worshiping communities worldwide. But let's stop for a moment to think about that. You see, originally Pentecost was representative of the time where everything was to converge, where people were being brought together by the Holy Spirit. And if we pause and reflect, what has resulted is anything but people being brought together. The day of Pentecost ushered in what would ultimately become a complicated web of institutions for which it is fair to ask the question, does this really, really represent God's hope for our human peculiarities? I had lunch this past week with a dear friend and sister in the faith I've known for over 25 years. She's turning 80 this year, which was very hard for me to believe. And we always have a good time catching up and hearing about each other's adventures, especially when it comes to life in the church. She has always been one of those wise people, those kinds of people that are so important to have in our lives. And I was interested in her conversation about where she was finding herself now in her faith journey. The bottom line is that she is at the place where most, in her words, of what the church does really has very little to do with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now, friends, this is a person who is a cradle Christian and has always, always been part of a faith community. Well, where we ultimately wound up in our conversation, surprise, surprise, was embracing Jesus' very basic teaching of loving God and loving neighbor. And we conversed about how it is all about tending to relationships and doing what we can to try to make this world 
a better place for people to live. Call it minimalist, call it a very low Christology, call it whatever you want. The point for me was well taken that so much of what we do as the community of faith really has little to do with what Jesus taught his first followers. And it's that kind of minimalist ideal that that creates, I believe, a real tension for us when we try to reconcile the whole of the biblical witness. What I mean by that is, well, do we rely on the words of Jesus as our guide? Or do we look to Paul's pragmatism in his letters to communities like the one at Corinth? How do we then resolve what seems to sometimes be conflicting ideals or theological ideas presented which are not sometimes at all apparent in the gospel narrative? Well, we've considered these last couple of weeks the dilemma that faced the congregation that was in ancient Corinth. We know that there were clashing ideals. We know there was a kind of racism that existed. There were destructive behaviors that seemed to have this community unraveling at the seams. And last week we looked at that familiar text of 1 Corinthians 13 which spoke of the need to operate out of love, especially when it came to the way that spiritual gifts were made present in the congregation. And today we've taken a closer look at that passage about the gifts of which Paul spoke. Now Paul's understanding of life in the church was one where he believed that the Holy Spirit had come and had gifted individuals with special abilities that, bottom line, were intended to edify the congregation as well as bring them together. In this discourse, he reminded the Corinthians of their pagan roots and how they were now, as people of God, being called to a different existence. And he reminded them that because they now had the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being manifest in in the speaking of tongues, being manifest in prophecy, being manifest in words of wisdom, because they had that, he said they now had the tools to help them build up this community, to make them one, and to keep them together. The Spirit, in Paul's understanding, gifted this faith community with specific abilities in order to build it up. And he used that imagery of of the body, of the one body, and stated that each gift represents a different part, talking about those gifts of the Spirit, and reminded them that each of these gifts, all of them together, were needed to make the body whole. And he reminded people that the gifting of people was something that was only done by the Spirit. It was not something that was to be earned or something that was to be claimed. It was a gift. And simply stated, God granted these gifts of the Spirit so that the people could be one, according to Paul. They were not to be in competition with one another. They were to focus on the wholeness of the body, the faith community. And Paul went so far as to say that both Jews and Greeks were called to be together and to be of one spirit. Now, friends, that was really significant because we might remember that Paul was becoming very frustrated in his ministry to Jewish Christians, so much so to the point that he started to focus his successive missionary journeys exclusively on the Gentile population. But still in his mind, he believed that all people, all people could come together in the Spirit. The other thing we need to remember is Paul also had this very powerful belief in the imminent return of Jesus into the world. What he was really saying, I think, on some levels, is that people only had to get along with each other for a little while. In fact, much of Paul's suggested measures have to be seen through these filters that the world was going to change when Jesus returned. So folks, you just got to get along with each other for a little bit. And when we look through that, it, it sort of changes the way we understand Paul. Paul, we remember, was very pragmatic. It was all about doing anything you needed to reach the goal. And it also helps us to understand a little bit more that his correctives were written for certain people in certain places at a certain time. 
We really don't know if he expected his teaching to be universal and out there forever. Now, the church, through much of his history, has assumed that. We also realize that in his attempt to keep things together, he made it clear that the most important thing was to conform. The faithful were to be of one spirit and to be dubious of the teachings of others if it was not in accord with Paul's teaching. But what we forget is he was being pragmatic about keeping those in these early churches working together. And it's helpful to realize and remember that any time a new movement develops, there can be pushback. So it is really essential for those involved in the movement to stick together, to hold up against that pushback. Well, the funny thing is that the church learned early on that this was not going to be an easy task, what Paul had set before us. It was easy to proclaim we are one, but it is a far different thing to put that into practice. Why? Because people are different, and we have different opinions, and different ideas, and different experiences. That's how it is now, and surely our ancient counterparts experienced the same. And history certainly teaches us that was the case. The early church became very concerned not only about how people behaved, but what they believed. And out of this emerged the need for the party line and over time complicated theologies and doctrines and worship practices emerged. And the assumption was, especially by those who were in power and those responsible for these ideas, that uniformity and conformity would make the people one. And that's a value that reaches far back in the church's DNA. But we also know from that came major splits within Christianity. Declaration that people because they didn't believe the same way, were heretics. And all of this was done in the name of theological unity and theological purity. Well, that quest has continued to weave through church history the subtle and not so subtle pressure to conform, always being there. I don't know about you, but I'm beginning to wonder, conform for what purpose? Is there a point when the quest for unity and being one should be questioned? When we're honest with ourselves, this quest has served far too often to be a tool that is used to marginalize, to exclude, and to sometimes outright persecute people who are not part of that one. Perhaps we need a new idea of unity and what it means to be one. An idea that says any time the result is oppression and disenfranchisement and condemnation because people are different, it is no longer a valid proposition. How can something that flies in the face of Jesus' teaching to love neighbor as self be held up as an ideal for people who yearn and desire to be followers of Jesus? How are we being one when race divides, when words of bigotry are spoken even in our churches? How are we being one when we condemn people because of the nation of origin and make all kinds of assumptions? How can we be one when we persecute people because of whom they choose to love? How are we being one when all we do is use this oneness in order to judge? Well, friends, my concern for the future is the message that our trying to be one has sent to the world around us, especially to those who are open to the message of Christ, to this good news and this hope, but they are unsure about whether they want to participate because of what they see. You don't think that's been a part of who we are? Well, look at very, something very simple like the creeds that we've used in the church. The Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. The intention of those was for people to have one theology, 
one opinion, one approach. It's something deeply inbred in who we are. Yet we continue to need to ask the question, is is this what is most helpful? Is this what will give us hope for the future? So I've been pondering, and I invite you to ponder with me, what would being one potentially look like in this day and in this age and coming from a new framework? Well, first of all, I believe we need to start with honesty. Honesty about claiming the triumphs and the shortfalls of the church throughout its history. But then I believe this new approach of being one starts first that we acknowledge that we are one in God. The reason we come together is because we are experiencing God tugging at us. Perhaps it's because of the questions we ask. Perhaps it's because of experiences we've had. And we might not fully know what is going on, but we come together because of the sense we need God. That's one of the ways for us to be one. We can be one in our belief that we are called to be followers of Jesus, that that is the primary function and role of the church, to equip ourselves to follow the one who told us to love God and to love each other. And that's how we go about being one, is we realize we are here to commit ourselves to this basic, basic teaching. And friends, I would like to suggest that in this time and in this place, That's what unity is about. It's not about conformity. It is about being unified in this mission before us to love God, to love each other, to love the world around us. I believe that's what it means to be one. Friends, on the day of Pentecost, God's Spirit came. And it changed everything. And friends, I believe the wind of Pentecost, the fire of Pentecost, the hope of Pentecost is still here. It still blows upon us, bringing us to new understandings, just the way it did for the first followers of Jesus on that first Pentecost day. So I invite us now to consider How is the wind of the Spirit? How is the fire of the Spirit blowing upon us? How do we respond to God's love for us? What is the message of Pentecost that we will bring to our hurting world? Amen.